Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our discussion on multipoint borehole extensometers. This webinar is geared towards new users. Today we will be discussing a lot of the upper and lower hardware components that are involved with these complex yet effective monitoring systems. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. All microphones will be kept on mute for the duration of the webinar. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat feature. You can see that chat feature right in the box shown here on the slide. And once this webinar is over, a survey will be emailed out to you. Please fill those out for us. We love to hear your feedback. It helps us improve our webinars moving forward. For today's agenda, we will be doing an introduction on the multi-point borehole extensometer, or MPBX, as you'll probably hear us call it. We'll also do a little review of some of the applications that we see these systems used for most frequently. And then we're going to be diving into the different hardware. So your upper hardware is going to include your head assemblies, your tube mounts, your standpipes, and the transducers all those fun things, and then we'll transition into the lower hardware, so everything that's going to be below your head assembly in the ground, such as your rods and tubes or the different anchor options. If you aren't familiar with Geocon, just a little bit about us before we start talking about the extensometers. We were founded in 1979. We have over 150 employees. We are now a 100% employee-owned organization. We also have a network of worldwide agents, and we manufacture a broad range of geotechnical instruments, all manufactured here at our factory in the US. Our primary focus is the vibrating wire instrument, um, but there are a few other products that we delve into, such as um, MEMS, for our tilt meters and inclinometer systems. You will be spending the majority of our webinar with Rob. Rob has more than 30 years of experience in instrumentation work, including instruments for the engineering aspects of excavations, pardon me, dams, landslides, and tunnels. This includes design, installation, monitoring, data reduction, and analysis of a variety of instruments. Rob has worked with project owners to develop instrumentation contract documentation and work with contractors and engineers alike to respond to contract documentation requests. These projects have ranged from backyard observation wells to multi-million dollar fully automated urban tunneling monitor programs. Joelle Razor, myself. I have 12 years of experience with instrumentation through a variety of positions that I held within Geocon, ranging from manufacturing to sales all the way to training coordinating, which is what I am doing today. This is where I collaborate with our experts, such as Rob, to bring educational materials to our customers. Thank you, Joelle, and thanks to those who are viewing this webinar on MPBX. This webinar is focused mostly on just the components and the parameters associated with the design and or installation of the MPBX. We're not going to get too far into the weeds with the design or with the installation or data evaluation at this point um, because there's so many variables, so many options um, that it's hard to kind of narrow down into a, a one hour or, or less discussion. For a lot of if you're interested in getting a lot more information and on how to do these things correctly, Geocon offers uh, in-house training twice a year. Um, typically lasts for about a day and a half each on the exosometers. And that provides you with a lot more in-depth knowledge of, of how to do these things and do them correctly. We also offer on-site field assistance with the, the assembly and installation of these things, if, if that's a, a route you'd like to go. It's, it does come at a, we do provide that at a cost, but the benefit is huge because you're getting a system that's designed and installed um, and hopefully working effectively as, as, as it should. Um, so reach out to Geocon, reach out to us if you're, if you're interested in that option, either one of those things. Um, and Joel will talk a little bit about that at the end, but I just want to give you that um, just information at, at this point. With that in mind, we'll jump into the content of today's seminar, webinar, 
and uh, talking about MPBXs. So the MPBX is stands for multi-point borehole exosometers. Um, they're basically designed to measure extension or compression associated with ground movements that might result from settlement, deformant, deformation, um, displacements, anything that's causing a general change in conditions in the formation that surrounds the instrument within the borehole. These MPBXs can typically consist of a head and then several anchors at various depths. And those anchors are tied or connected to the head via a rod that's sleeved. Um, they can be, while the name indicates multi-point, they can be single points if necessary, or any number of uh, up to possibly eight points or more if, if, if the manufacturer can do so and if they can fit within the borehole. Um, Typically, we recommend that these things be pre-assembled on the ground. I mean, you'll get all these kind of components delivered to you, and it's ideally best for you to pre-assemble them on the ground before insertion into the borehole. Um, but that's, again, a preference and uh, determined based on the installation and application. So, again, the various topics we're going to kind of cover today are the components associated with the MPBX systems and um, some of the parameters associated with how to determine what components are best suited for you. So listed here are, are some various applications that uh, the MPBXs could be used in. There's a lot of other ones out there that, that may be uh, somewhat applicable, but typically like fills and embankments, tunnels, foundation monitoring, um, slopes, landslides analysis, just a variety of different applications that could be used for these things. We're going to break up the discussion into two parts, the upper hardware and then the lower hardware. Upper hardware, as the name would imply, would be kind of the head assembly and anything associated with components around the ground. So the upper hardware we're focusing on is the head assembly. The head assembly basically, typically from Geocon anyway, comes in two components. You've got the transducer housing and then the tube mount uh, assembly. The tube mount is on the bo bottom portion of the, uh, uh, the assembly. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but basically that's the lower portion where the rods and tubes get connected into. And then the transducer housing, is, as the name would imply, um, is located at the top of the head assembly. And that's where the transducers or the monitoring uh, portion of the, the PBX assembly is at. The head is usually has a protective cover that helps kind of keep the transducers sealed from the environment or elements around it. Um, and there's a variety of different means of taking measurements. We'll talk about that a little bit here shortly. So there's a variety of different things that need to be considered when uh, designing the head assembly. And this is where we talk, start talking about all the variables. Um, some of the things to consider are, the first one would be the measurement options. Um, how are these things going to be read? Well, there's a variety of different ways to do it. Um, you can measure it manually, and those could be done here with uh, what's shown on this slide here with the um, micrometer, the depth micrometer, or a dial indicator. And those would involve you coming out to the field periodically and manually taking measurements of the top of the rods relative to a plate um, above the top of the rods. Electronic measurements can be performed using a variety of different devices. On the top here, we show the, the vibrating wire displacement transducer. There's also an LVDT, LVDT and a linear potentiometer that can be used for measuring electronic output of the displacement transducer or the, the rods. We also can provide what's called a combined uh, head assembly, um, combined readout device. And that would in involve having some electronic component for measurement of the, head, the rods, as, all, as well as a manual means of measurement of the type of the rods. So that way, um, you can provide some level of redundancy in case there's questions on the output from the transducers, um, or just a way of verifying uh, what you're seeing. The vibrating wire transducers are typically the majority of the types of uh, electronic de devices that we provide with our MPBXs. I would say probably about 95% of 
of the um, electronic measurement means associated with the MPBXs have the vibrating wire transducers. And we go with that because, well, we're manufacturers of vibrating wire equipment, but also because they've been proven to have um, longevity uh, associated with the, the use of these devices. These things have been around for years. We've got several of them monitoring uh, projects that have gone on for you know four decades or more. They are they have long-term stability as as I just uh, referred to. Um, you can have significantly long cable runs if you want to have um, you know miles of of cable that don't have uh, result in degradation of the signal. Um, and they're fairly rugged uh, instruments or sensors that can be used. So typically uh, we would recommend or suggest the use of vibrating wire transducers if you're getting uh, electronic measurements done on your uh, MPBXs. Another thing to consider um, when designing your head assembly is the range of movement expected. Um, this will have a play with uh, the association with the um, transducers themselves, because the, the more range you're gonna have, the longer those transducers can get. Um, here's an example of our transducers up to 50 millimeters in length. They have a 3 8 inch diameter shaft and um, the length is shown here for A, which is the measurement from the back of the coil to the tip of the transducer can be up to uh, 12 inches for a 50 millimeter um, transducer. When you move up to the larger transducers on the order of 100 millimeter range to 300 millimeter range, the overall length of these things can be upwards of, of four feet or you know 1,230 millimeters. That's pretty significant and something to consider when you're having to design your head. You know, all four feet of that transducer is not going to be sticking above the head assembly. Some portion of it will be within the head assembly or below, but still you may have um, upwards of three feet of that transducer sticking above ground or sticking above the head assembly. So something to consider when you're designing um, the system. Another thing to consider is um, the collar hardware. And that's how will this head assembly be fixed at the top of the borehole? To, put, to kind of ensure a point of fixity or to ensure that it's not going to be moving. There's a variety of different ways that we offer. Um, one is the flange assembly, and that basically uh, is where you could probably rest the, the head assembly at the top of the borehole uh, on the shoulders of that drilled borehole, um, if that's fairly competent material. If it's soft soil, that's probably not likely, but if it's like rock or concrete, um, then then you could probably just rest the top of the assembly via the flange at the top of the borehole and support the, the installation. Another means of supporting it would be a coupling that attaches the um, the tube mount to the to the transducer housing um, to a standpipe that fits down inside the borehole. Using the coupling, you could have it kind of wedged into the top of the borehole using actual wedges or maybe some concrete packed in around there to secure it. Um, a variety of different means to do it. The coupling could allow you to fit it into a smaller diameter hole um, so that, that recess is a little bit further. Another option might be the bladder where you've got a hydraulically activated bladder. You, re, you kind of lower this down, the head down into the portion, the top of the borehole, um, hydraulically activate that bladder and it enlarges and, and locks into the formation or the top of the borehole there and, and kind of holds it in place. So there's a variety of different means of holding that in place or things to consider during the design process. Another uh, thing to look at is how is this exotometer going to be oriented? Is it going to be drilled upwards in underground opening or you know vertically down? Most of the ones at ground surface are probably vertically down because you're at ground surface and nothing else is you know, inclined so much. But if you're in an underground opening or perhaps on the side of a slope, you're going to be doing it uh, inclined upwards, inclined downwards, um, or upwards. So those things need to be kind of considered. Um, this could possibly influence how the uh, system's going to be installed. If it's a fairly long installation, it's hard to get these things pushed upright. Um, going down, you've got gravity kind of helping you out. Going up, um, gravity's fighting you, so you've got to figure out how to get these things all the way up in there if they're fairly long and heavy. 
sometimes you might have to consider putting a an anchor at the back of your borehole that has a pulley system that you can help kind of pull it into place. Um, so those are things you kind of need to consider uh, with the orientation as well. Another consideration is the borehole diameter. Um, these things can be installed in almost any direction, um, but it's sometimes uh, sometimes important to understand the borehole diameter to be, you know, to work with the, the collar hardware, um, the, the anchors that you're going to be using, um, how many anchors you're going to be having. So if you've got, you know, say like eight anchors, um, that enlarges the head assembly significantly, even the tube mount assembly. So you've got to have a borehole of sufficient size to accommodate that, depending on, you know, how that head's going to be, you know, placed in the borehole or above it. Um, if you're using like bladder anchors, those have a certain diameter to them, and the, your borehole needs to be of a certain diameter to accommodate those bladder anchors as well. So understanding uh, not only the borehole orientation, but the diameter is important as well. If you're going to be installing through a drill casing or drill auger, um, it's important to understand what size ID is that uh, the, the drilling equipment so that you can fit your equipment down through that or without it getting stuck. Um, especially the tube mount at the top. Uh, we don't talk about it too much in this discussion, but one thing that's important to note is that when you get these exosomer pieces delivered to you, the transducer housing and the tube mount come attached. And for as part of your installation, you detach the two transducer housing from the tube mount and you're gonna install just the tube mount and the rods and the anchors into the hole and get those set into place either by hydraulically activating those anchors or grouting them in place. And then once that's set, then you'll come back and install the transducer housing later. Um, it's a slight diversion from my conversation, but it's just an important thing to consider here. So if you're installing through a drill auger, tube mount needs to be able to fit through the ID of the auger. And then surface completion. You know, how is this system going to be completed at the end? Um, is it going to be extending above ground, such as shown in this picture? Um, in which case, you know, talking about those transducer heights again, uh, that's something to consider. If, if you're using fairly long transducers with a big range, you need to be able to provide protection of that head assembly when it's extending above ground. Um, you're going to have this thing sticking above ground two or three feet. You want to make sure you've got some bollards or some structure around it that's going to uh, prevent somebody from driving their truck through it or you know deer or cattle running through it um, people vandalizing it um, any kind of a number of things can happen to things that stick above ground as many of you may know another thing to consider if it's sticking above ground is that these transducers the vibrating wire transducers are um, heavily influenced by thermal fluctuations. So it's very important to try to limit those thermal uh, fluctuations on these devices. So if this thing's sticking above ground and those transducers are in that cap, it's basically like they're in an enclosed box and the sun's beating on it. It's gonna be like your little kid or dog inside the car. Sorry to say that. Um, but it's just bad things to have those things enclosed and having the sun beating on them. So if you can have it enclosed like a shed over it or some means to keep the sunlight from beating on it, that will reduce the thermal fluctuations you'll see in the transducers and provide better uh, consistency in your output from those transducers. If you're going to be recessing it below ground, you won't have to worry about, you know, as much the thermal influences or potential vandalism as long as you put um, some sort of a cap or a monument cover over the top of this thing. Um, you do want to make sure that if you're recessing it below ground, that you're allowing sufficient room for you to get down there and, and get the transducers installed. So it may involve having to do an overcore where your upper portion of your borehole is overcored to accommodate the space needed to get down there and do some work um, and or the space to install the flange if you're going that route. Um, so some things to consider with regards to whether it's going to be uh, recessed or sticking above ground. Another thing to look at if it's going to be recessed 
is that while these things um, typically are fairly water resistant and the transducers are rated for one megapascals of pressure, so they can handle being submerged. Um, ideally, it's a good idea to try to make sure there's a way that the water can drain out of these, uh, these if you've kind of created a monument or something like that, or to keep water from getting into them. Um, because sometimes water, depending on where it's running from, maybe the streets or you know certain runoff, might be somewhat corrosive. And over time, if that thing's submerged for extended periods of time, it can get in there and cause corrosion on the components. So try to try to minimize the, the potential for water getting in uh, to these devices. And then lastly, for designing the head assembly, um, something to consider is whether this thing's gonna be grouted and how it's gonna be grouted. Um, there's typically, um, we provide with our design a hole through the center of the tube mount to accommodate um, a flexible grout pipe. And the grout pipe that Geocom provides is a three quarter inch ID, which provides a little bit over an inch OD. Um, and this flexible grout pipe can be extended through the tube mount uh, housing down along the deepest anchor. Um, and you can secure it at various lengths along the deepest rod anchor system. Um, and then extend out just a little bit below the bottom of that bottom anchor to where it can try to discharge the grout. Um, if you don't have the size of a borehole to accommodate the head having that grout hole, that can be changed to, to so you don't have a hole through the assembly to accommodate that grout pipe. Um, and then with that case, the grout pipe can go off to the side of the head. Um, or through maybe if you've got a flange, uh, in this picture shows a, a drilled hole through the side of the flange to accommodate um, a, a, another grout pipe. Sometimes you might use the driller's grout pipes. They're, they're retrievable, uh, re reusable uh, flush coupled grout pipes, in which case you probably won't be able to get through the hole in the tube mount, but you could go off to the side of the head assembly with that. Um, so. Think about how, you know, talk with the drillers, figure out how you're gonna grout this thing, um, whether you're providing the grout line or they're providing the grout line and how it's gonna be uh, configured with the head assembly. Now we'll move on to the lower hardware. That's everything that's basically below ground um, and below the tube mount assembly that we talked about. Some of the things to consider with regards to the below ground components are uh, the type of anchors. Um, there's a variety of different types of anchors that can be used. Um, we typically will deal with three of them. And those three that shown here are the grottable anchor, the hydraulic bladder anchor on the right, and then a hydraulic boros anchor here on the left. Uh, not shown, but indicated is the snap ring. And basically the snap ring is similar to the hydraulic bladder anchor in, in um, conf configuration or, or imagery, I guess, except for it doesn't have the copper bladder wrapped around it. It's got a snap ring that's wrapped around the top of that plastic uh, cylinder and then one around the bottom and a pole pin is attached through both ends of uh, the snap rings. I'm attached to the pole ring, it's a cable or, or a cord that goes all the way to the surface. And when that anchor gets to the depth you need it to be, you would pull that cord and it'd activate those snap rings or slip rings. And they basically pop out and lock against the formation or the side of the borehole to hold that anchor in place. We don't offer that snap ring anchor anymore, um, but it is out there. I know other manufacturers still offer it. And uh, there's been a fair amount of installations that provide that uh, available provide that. So um, basically we're talking mostly about the three different types of anchors at this point. And the main factors for determining which type of anchor you're going to use depends on possibly maybe cost, uh, familiarity with the types of anchors, and more often than not, what type of surrounding formation you're going to be utilizing these anchors in. So the most commonly used type of anchor is the grottable anchor. And that is typically um, from Geocon anyway, it's a 25 millimeter diameter piece of rebar that's uh, been epoxy coated for corrosion protection. And it's about 230 millimeters in length 
we drill a hole through that uh, anchor to provide access for the rod to sleeve all the way through and then secure at the bottom using a swage lock compression fitting. These um, can be used for both the stainless steel and fiberglass rods. Um, typically you're used in rock or medium to dense type of soils. Um, these also are used in downward applications mostly, but can be used in upward applications. Um, it might be difficult in an upward installation with this kind of a, a flexible rod type of thing and flexible, not flexible anchor, but you know, just a, that thing to try to push it up into a, um, a hole that may have some deviations or something like that. So uh, depending on the application, uh, these are better suited for mostly downward hole installations. Um, but again, possible in other types of uh, orientations. So the hydraulic bladder anchor is another type of anchor commonly used. Um, this is more uh, seen with like rock or concrete installations where you've got a fairly competent hole and uh, it can stay open sufficiently long enough to get these larger diameter anchors uh, back into the hole, um, either vertically down or typically up. The benefit of these is grouting is not required to secure those anchors in place. And so uh, for upward installations, uh, especially where you don't wanna have grout pouring down on you while you're doing your installation, these are very beneficial. Um, grout can be used with these to kind of, in conjunction with the bladder, help hold everything in place, but it's not required. Um, you wanna make sure that uh, the borehole is fairly clean and not too irregular because it is a little tough to kind of feed these in there because these are designed to accommodate the size of borehole um, that you indicate to us. Um, so there's not a lot of clearance, but hopefully enough that you can get these things in fairly easily. So typically with these copper bladder anchors, you've got that copper bladder that has a, a nylon tube attached to it that it routes up to the surface where you connect up to um, a hand pump. And once you start activating that hand pump, assuming your bladder anchor is the design depth that you, you want it to be at, um, you activate that hand pump and it basically unfurls the copper bladder from that plastic cylinder. And it, as it does that, it slowly engages the sidewalls of the borehole. And you keep pumping until it reaches a certain pressure that's indicated in our manual. I think it's probably about 1500 PSI. Once you've achieved the, the set pressure and that pressure stabilizes, it's not going to you know, drop off any uh, while you're pumping it, just keeps stepping up a little bit with more pressure. Um, you can disengage the hand pump and you lose pressure in the, in the nylon tubing, but that copper bladder is permanently deformed and locked in place and holding steady. Um, so even if you accidentally rupture the hydraulic line while you're pumping, uh, it's probably more often than not gonna be permanently deformed and locked into place as long as you've been pumping it enough to get up to pressure. So great things for uh, competent material like rock or concrete, um, just need to have that borehole sized accordingly to accommodate that device. Another type of hydraulically activated anchor is the hydraulic boros anchor. And that boros anchor basically consists of a steel cylinder with steel rods inside of it that uh, when activated will form those rods to come out in an arc and lock into the surrounding formation. And these, these prongs, as they call them, will come out at about 120 degrees to each other. So there's three prongs around the perimeter. And um, we have two different types. We have the, the, the single, the lower uh, prong sections or a double acting uh, prongs where you've got prongs on top as well. So similar to the bladder anchor, you've got a, a nylon tube that routes up to the, the ground surface. Um, where you connect a hydraulic jack, a hydraulic hand pump to it and pump away until, and when, when you're doing that, this forces a disc within the cylinder to push down and force those rods out to create that arc to, to lock onto the surrounding formation. And so you pump away to cause those rods to come out and you keep pumping and pumping and pumping and eventually the pressure builds up and stabilizes at around 1500 PSI or so and that means that those rods are fully extended and locked into the formation. 
Um, if it's soft soil, they fully extend and lock in. If it's like rock or concrete, they'll extend until they can't go any further and the pressure builds up to a point where you say, okay, enough is enough. And um, you can't, if you break the hydraulic lines or they burst um, or you overpressure them, there's no problems because those prongs are going to stay permanently deformed out. They're not going to retract back into the body of the of the cylinder there. They are permanently fixed uh, against the sidewalls of the, of the formation. The beauty of this one is, uh, again, grout is not necessary, but you can use grout to kind of help provide a belt and suspenders type of uh, encapsulation around the anchor. And then um, the typically can be used in, in downward directed soft boreholes, um, but can be used upwards and also in, in uh, rock or concrete, like we mentioned. Uh, these might be a little bit better suited for uh, like rock core holes where the rock's kind of crumbly or fractured and they keep, you know, blocking the, the access for uh, the boros anchor, um, or the, not the boros, but the, the bladder anchor because the bladder anchor is, you know, size just a little bit smaller than the diameter of the borehole. Um, so if there's variability in the, in the borehole, uh, some deviations, or if uh, it's raveled or fractured materials falling in on the borehole, it's just tough to get those bladder anchors in. So the boros anchor, um, you know, smaller diameter, rigid, rigid tube can be pushed through that kind of material and then activated to lock in and provide the acreage point. Another consideration for below ground components is the rods and tubes. And the rods and tubes are integral in attaching the anchors and kind of communicating displacement from those zones up to the head assembly. So having an understanding of what type of rod or tube you're gonna be using is kind of important. Some of the factors that you need to kind of consider with the selection of the rods or tubes may be, um, you know, how this thing is going to be oriented. If it's vertically down, um, your installation should be fairly easy because you're using gravity to kind of help pull everything into place. If it's vertically up and it's fairly long, you've got a fair amount of weight to try to get up in there. And if you're trying to use um, something that's not too stiff, the rods aren't too stiff, it's going to be very, you know, very pliable and, and, and hard, or flexible and very hard to get it up into the hole. Um, so, something needs to be considered with regards to that. Um, maybe there's space limitations and you can't um, flex or bend the stainless steel rods uh, sufficiently enough to get it, <coughs> excuse me, into the borehole with, a, with the space limitations you have. Another consideration might be uh, thermal influences. Uh, some of the rods have better coefficients of expansion than the other ones. So if you've got or if you're expecting conditions where you might see a significant thermal fluctuations along the length of the rods, um, that might be play into the decision of what types of rods you might want to use. So there's three different types of rods that Geocon typically provides or can offer for your application. Uh, for the most part, um, these are stainless steel rods, fiberglass, or graphite. And for the majority of the installations, stainless steel is used. And those typically come in five or 10 foot lengths um, with a male thread and a female thread on the other end uh, to make a, a, a flush coupled section of rod. Um, the rigidity of the stainless steel rods typically make them ideal for upward installations or installations where you want to make sure that you've got um, a greater modulus of elasticity for the, the whole system. Um, they typically have a higher um, thermal coefficient of expansion than the other types of rods. So if, like I mentioned before, if you've got concerns about um, thermal fluctuations at depth within your borehole, uh, you might consider some other option. The fiberglass rods are a little bit more convenient because actually they come full length uh, of the anchor depth when, uh, when they're uh, delivered to you. So you'll have them pre-coiled with the sleeving over them, the, the nylon tubing or polyethylene tubing over the fiberglass rods and oftentimes connected to the anchor itself already. So if you have like, for example, three anchors at, very <coughs> excuse me, at various depths, you'll get a coil with all three rods coiled up in this big bundle um, delivered for you to, to get out there and 
transport it to the site and uncoil and be ready to install down the hole. Um, the one thing I shall caution you about with the fiberglass rods when they come in those big coils is that they're under a lot of tension. And so when you start cutting the tape on this, this coil, um, you want to be very careful, make sure that you've got a good hold on the ends of these things or have a couple people kind of holding it so that when you cut these things, these things don't fly everywhere and start snapping in the face and causing problems, uh, which Geocon is not responsible for. Um, so fiberglass is very convenient, especially in, in small uh, space areas where you can't use the stainless steel rods. Um, we typically don't suggest using fiberglass for installations greater than 100 feet just because there's not the stiffness associated with them. And so getting them into exact positions of where you, you need them to be may or may not happen if they're not that stiff. Um, if thermal fluctuations along the length of the installation are going to be a concern, like I mentioned, maybe it's a concrete dam that has a fairly thin section and you're stalling from the top, use graphite rods. Those have a very low uh, coefficient of thermal, thermal expansion much better than uh, the fiberglass and definitely much better than the stainless steel. Um, so those, if you can use the graphite rods, it helps limit, you know, thermal expansion of those rods when the temperatures are changing within the formation or within the uh, surrounding area around the borehole, the installation. A little bit more expensive, but you don't have to deal with uh, evaluating and understanding what's going on with your installation below ground. Um, associated with temperature fluctuations. Um, you will see temperature fluctuations at the head and there is a trans uh, a thermistor in the head assembly to account for that or to, to be able to evaluate the temperature fluctuations and you can apply temperature corrections to the transducers themselves but that thermistor is only at the head it doesn't do anything for the rods down the hole so I need to understand that as well when you're doing the design. The rods need to be encapsulated or sleeved in the tubing of some sort to protect them from the grout or even just if it's not grouted, maybe even just debris within the hole. Uh, we typically will recommend use of um, the PVC pipe shown in the upper right hand corner for the stainless steel rods or the graphite rods. Uh, it's, a, it's a quarter inch diameter schedule 40 uh, PVC pipe and about a quarter inch ID. Um, so it's fairly small. <clears throat> and um, typically gets coupled with slip couplers and, and glue. Um, for the fiberglass rods, as I mentioned, those come from the factory already with the, the, the tubing on them, and they'll either be a nylon tubing for the fairly short lengths or um, maybe a polyethylene tubing for the longer lengths of, of fiberglass rods. Similar to the head assembly, Another thing to consider is the range of movement that's going to be expected. Um, with the transducers, we talked about how that's going to increase the size of your head if you get larger range transducers. Um, similarly, um, if you're expecting a fair amount of movement, that might affect things down hole. Uh, typically with the installations, we provide what's called a guide tube that attaches to the bottom of the, the, the tube mount. And the guide tube is used to provide a connection point from the tubes coming up from the anchors into the uh, head assembly. And they can either be uh, like a barbed fitting from the nylon tubes um, associated with the fiberglass rods or a threaded connection from, or maybe, a, I'm sorry, a slip connection uh, associated with the stainless steel or graphite rods and the, the, the PVC pipes. Um, if you're expecting a fair amount of movement like we talked about with, uh, and you've got fairly large range transducers or, um, you know, 100, 150 millimeters of, of uh, range of movement, you may consider using some slip couplers in association with your uh, PVC pipes. Um, the, the rods will move um, and it cause the transducers to, to change their position, but the PVC sleeving will not move. Um, unless it slips in the grout and you really don't want that to happen necessarily, but it can. Um, so it, to, to prevent the, the tubing or the pipes from breaking from, from excessive movement, a slip coupler can be put in line uh, right below the guide tubes or at some point along the, the length of the rods. These slip couplers typically provide for up to uh, six inches of movement. 
And so if you're expecting more than that, you might want to put a couple of slip couplers in there. Um, but, you know, if your your transducer range is only uh, 100 millimeters, then one slip coupler will probably accommodate uh, that amount of movement. And then another thing to consider is your datum. Where is your point of fixity for this system? Um, the datum it can be either the deepest anchor point, which is commonly, uh, or actually the most common uh, point of reference for the system. So that datum would be providing a point of fixity, of that deepest anchor relative to the, the head assembly. Um, and soft soil or rock, um, it's a point that's not gonna be deforming. Uh, so it's below you know, areas where you're gonna see settlement or compression or uh, displacement. Um, if it doesn't, if your application doesn't allow for that deepest anchor to be your point of fixity, um, such as like a tunnel, you're installing your MPBX over a tunnel alignment, then you'll have to rely on the head assembly itself <coughs> as your datum point, your reference point. And in doing that, ideally, the, it's best to have uh, a level survey performed on your installation periodically um, just to verify where the absolute position of that head is so that you can know you know its movement relative to the anchors below ground um, with the fixed point at the bottom you know in, in non-displacing soil you know that that point is not moving and so everything uh, the head relative to that point and the other anchors relative to the head to that deepest anchor um, it's all relative to the, that fixed datum point. So no, understanding your datum point and having a means of uh, establishing where it is and you know what, what it is, is very important. And then additional instruments. Um, some of those folk, some of you folks may install inclinometer casings and attach additional instruments to them like a vibrating wire piezometer or maybe a settlement system like a Sondax or or some devices on the exterior of the casing um, because you're been using the benefit of the, a drilled hole and you're trying to maximize what you can measure within that drilled hole uh, with instrumentation. With the MPBX, um, you don't wanna put a whole lot more stuff in there because you've already got, depending on the number of anchors, you've got several tubes, um, but it, it's not a, a bad thing necessary to throw like a vibrating wire piezometer somewhere in there <coughs> or two. You do want to make sure you account for the signal cables coming up through the head assembly. Um, so when you're working with your uh, sales representative or whatever, um, they'll work with the designer to indicate, you know, the customer wants a couple of piezometer cables coming up through the head assembly. So they need to make sure that head assembly is large enough to accommodate not only the displacement transducers associated with the anchors and the rods, but the additional cables coming up and out of that head assembly. So those are things to consider uh, with the, with regards to the design uh, of the below ground components. And with that, I'm going to wrap it up and hand it back over to Joelle. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you again for joining us today for our discussion on the multi-point borehole extensometer. If you have any follow-up questions or if you need any assistance with any kind of instrumentation, project, quote, order, etc., in the future, we would love to hear from you. Here on this slide is our sales team email address. If you need to contact anyone regarding a quote, a sales order, or if you have an upcoming project and you're not quite sure what instruments you might need, or you have a spec that you need to review, our sales team can assist you with any of those tasks. Our technical support group is available. Typically, they will be helping you if you have already purchased equipment from us and you have any installation questions, software set questions, or anything of the like. So you can feel free to reach out to our support group with any existing instrumentation that you might have. Our training team is also available to help you set up any kind of hardware or product training for our instruments or our data loggers and software. Typically, we try to organize these trainings before you are out in the field so that your technicians arrive ready to go. 
So please feel free to reach out to us with any of your future training needs. Thank you again for joining us and we hope you have a wonderful day.